Welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody. It's uh, there's so many just looking around the room, see so many familiar faces, smiles. Uh, this is a space that we've, as I said in our intro before, we've been greatly anticipating holding together again, and we're so glad to uh, to be with you here. I am sitting in what is known as Vancouver, British Columbia, which is the unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salitooth nations. I am an uninvited visitor to these lands, try to be a custodian of this place, as well as build my own attachment to this place that, that has an ancestry that will date, date many millennia before me and many millennia after. We are opening this series on regeneration as, as solvable. And we're doing this in partnership with a number of incredible organizations and people. And you're going to get to meet a few of those and spend time with them today. We chose the topic of regeneration because not because we sought to define regeneration, but because rather we think that this is a huge exploratory space for possibility into the future that is emerging. So we are intentionally choosing not to be simplistic and reductivist about what regeneration is or is not. At the same time, encourage you to explore those very questions in this conversation and in the following seven questions, that, conversations that we have after this one. This, in terms of holding this space, we, we do consider ourselves a, a custodian for this hour and a half we to get, have together of this space we are we considered a space of holding change together there's all kinds of possibility that each of us bring into this space and we cherish that as as sacred uh, this is not intended as a webinar so if you were thinking you were going to be in passive mode the entire time that is we're going to ask a lot more of you than that the reason being is there's lots of opportunities to get to uh, share in the collective you know the wisdom of tyson and he's got so much to share at the same time we also want to use that as a space to explore relationships and build relationships with others we would like to now introduce jen and bob with new stories and hear from each of you um what made you say yes to this invitation why are you here with us today and we're so glad that you are you know i said yes because this is such an important time that we're alive in and most of us, when we're honest about it, don't know what we're doing. We feel these yearnings. I feel this yearning to help people create lives and communities that actually work again. And like many others, feel like I'm making that up as I go along. So the chance to come together with this, this wonderful network of people that, as I looked at the screen, you know, I see some some beloveds out of my life, but I see all these people that, that are part of the solvable community. And so as much as anything, you know, this is an opportunity to, to connect with a broader set of folks in these questions of, of how we live well right now. So it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. I think um, everything that, that Bob said, and for me, uh, well, I think for all of us, you know, the pandemic really opened up all these different portals of possibility. And uh, for me, one of the really big ones was around this connection between decolonizing and systems thinking and, and this idea of regeneration. And um, not too long after the pandemic was declared, I stumbled upon Tyson's book on Sand Talk and, or it stumbled upon me, we're never quite sure how this works, but um, it really was just the, the perfect time. And I remember just telling everybody about it as a, a great, a great bridge between, I keep looking over here because it's on my bookshelf, but uh, a great bridge between these, these two worlds. and much like what Bob is pointing to, the opportunity to come together with co-conspirators and, and Tyson around these, these three kind of pieces and build some bridges and, and weave some fabric together is a, a really solid yes for me. And I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Yeah, we're 
so glad you're here. Yes, huge thanks to New Stories for hosting us with us. I'm glad to have you in this space. And now I'd like to welcome Tyson Yonkaporta. Tyson, since you uh, didn't give me a bio and insisted that I write one for you on my own, I'm going to spare the introduction and I'll, I'll leave it to you if, uh, if you want to give one. Um, and with that, I'll also ask you why you chose to accept our invitation to be here. <laughs> ah, the bio. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm so uh, resistant of branding. <laughs> it's like, um, there's lots of people trying to market me now, but, but the one thing I refuse to do is market myself um, and fall into that trap that most people in the knowledge economy are in right now of, um, you know, relentlessly branding themselves like a little mini corporation. I'm, I'm trying to avoid that trap. I don't want to deploy those WMDs of, of PR. Um, <laughs> not even for myself. <laughs> I don't think I'd ever come back from that. Um, <clears throat> so I'm on Bunurong country now. Um, a place called Nam. Um, it's been called Melbourne at the moment. It'll probably be called a lot of different things um, as we go along. Um, yeah, it used to be a swamp. Now it's mostly concrete and bitumen and yeah, and a few possums uh, sort of climbing around on power lines. <laughs> they can't climb the trees though, because people put like these little plastic guards around them to stop the possums getting into the trees because they, they wreck the trees. They wreck it with their sharp claws. It looks ugly. Um, yeah. So yeah. And I guess, uh, my, place time now is you know a a kind of a COVID thing and i guess we'll get into the intricacies of that but um yeah and i, I refer to that as place time because you know your place is place and time is, is sort of really bound up um <laughs> together and you know depending yeah. on what kind of enclosures you choose to put around yourself or bubbles uh etc um you know, your, your time's going to run differently. Uh, but we'll get into the physics of that after. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, good to be here. Um, I've got my, I've got my time stick here. <laughs> um, that was one of the chapters in, in that book. And um, yeah, ready to roll, ready to, ready to have the yarns. <clears throat> and why did I say yes? Ah, uh, cause I don't know there there was a, I, I, there was a spot in the calendar. Like I just, I just check. And if, if it hap if people are inviting me and it happens to land on one of the white squares, which are like, there's not many of them left. Then I just go, yeah, like that. And, um, plus Peter Tavernese was going to be here and you know, he's been, uh, helping me shape this, um, uh, indigenous knowledge systems lab. Um, all this year at, at Deakin University and no one can say no to Adam Adam Lerner not with a name like that he's a, he's a good learner you'd have to be thank you Tyson so let's let's uh, let's crack this open about your place place time we're here to talk about futures and I'm I'm curious for you to uh, to where would you start where do you want to start and we will, this is very much designed as an emergent conversation. So everyone knows we did not pre-plan a series of questions for this conversation. We are flowing with this question as it emerges uh, to go deeply into, uh, into this moment. And so I, I, how would you like to begin by defining time and our relationship to uh, this concept of future? Or you can completely throw it out if you'd like. <laughs> yeah um i don't know futures is it's funny isn't it it's like there's a um it's like a decision tree or something and uh you're trying to build a chatbot <laughs> and have all you know all your possible branches you know coming off um i don't know if anyone's ever played around with decision trees in <laughs> you know uh computation all that sort of thing um but they're, they're always fun um <clears throat> Yeah, we were trying to actually make a, we're trying to, we're messing around with decision trees and trying to figure out how to do a yarn bot rather than a chat bot. 
like what would an AI look like that was having an indigenous yarn and it just doesn't work <laughs> it's the decision tree thing so we're, we're having to come up with something completely different like a completely different um, you know machine learning little being that's that's going to graze on data but then we, we have trouble finding the data sets we wanted to graze on um, so I, I think that's not going to work that project um, yeah how did you deal Look, with this the spatial place notion of that AI uh, yeah well that's just it so you know um algorithms much like viruses they're not little sort of beings or entities maybe they're they're more kind of um, processes, you know, <clears throat> rather than organisms. But then you could probably describe yourself that way as well, that you're more of a process than an organism if you're like bringing that temporal kind of thing <laughs> in. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of tricky thinking about time right now. Um, because t time, is, time is basically about, you know, uh, what your systems are, the systems that you inhabit. Um, so if you seek to um, create enclosures, then then you've got that second law of thermodynamics coming in um, heavier than usual. <laughs> Whenever you create like a vacuum, a, a closed space, um, you increase entropy. You know, you can't maintain complexity because you've limited the way <clears throat> that that little system can interact with other systems. You know, so, I mean, you know, when when we all inevitably go into our pods and, and hook ourselves up to the metaverse, um, you know, our bodies as systems that they won't last long if because they'll be in a pod. They'll be they'll, they'll become entropic really quickly. Like you really quickly find out just how uh, dependent your body, how much of your body is made up of the systems that you inhabit and move between I mean, all the little parasites and beings that are coming from the environment and making up most of your body and you know you're just going to wither away into this weird little smeagol in a box that's um yeah. <laughs> so weirdly that's what makes time run forward smeagol in a box schroding is smeagol schroding is smeagol that's that's what that's what makes that happen. <laughs> That's beautiful. There's going to be t-shirts and coffee cups. <laughs> yeah. Shorty. Except then, like all these nerds will job, that's not a uh, secular thermodynamics. That's, that's the uncertainty principle. It's just, um, you know. don't fact check me. All right. This, I'm doing like hipster pop science here. It's not that that's my, that's my, that's my market niche is, is hipster science. It's uh, <laughs> There That's where you no find me in, in a bookstore in the hipster science section. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah, so that's, uh, I don't know, we, I think we'll keep exploring this, but I just feel like, okay, if I, if I, if I get into that completely now, then I'm going to monologue, monologue for 10 minutes. So, yeah. so let, let's, well, let's break can... it up and, and just run with some thoughts on, on that bit. And then we'll yeah. go further into the enclosures uh, side of things. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, what's happened to those over COVID for different populations? Mm. Mm. And I, ca I want to catch two different threads and then we can just, you can just, yeah, whatever, sweet. choose if either of them are interesting or not. The, the Deci first decision thread, tree. Yeah, oh my goodness, we landed in a decision tree. It's for sweet perfection. So, um, <laughs> I'm just curious um, about what kind of what kinds of images um, can you share with us about for more expansive thinking about time. I feel like um, for me as a non-indigenous Western minded person, I get stuck in like spirals and figures of eight. And that's hmm. kind of where the imaging that's as far as it goes. So I'm curious about, um, and your book was actually, I was so delighted by this real grounding of drawings in the sand and drawings mm. in my hand as ways to um, understand differently. Mm. It's, um, yeah. Uh, see, I always look at that infinity sign and I don't know, so I see, 
you know, I, I just I see that same that same sort of um, uh, closed system of the Ouroboros Ouroboros thing. You know, the snake eating its tail. Like I see that, except it's sort of been twisted for this uh, this this kind of binary thing going on. You know. Um, like you see that Hegelian thing happening where it's like, oh, it's one thing, but it's two things. But there's an overlap, so there's a third thing. Ooh, third space. Hybridity, everything's groovy. Um, so I see that there, and that's and that's that's important. That's a good heuristic as well. There's there's no such thing as a bad a bad model. Cause they all work in their context, you know. So um yeah, that um so I guess thinking about that Ouroboros. Um, that could be a good way in, you know, I guess that snake eating its tail, because that's supposed to be a symbol of infinity. But from my place time, it's, um, it looks like he's just eating himself. He finished like, and, and it boggles your mind, how does that end up? Is it just an inside out head at the end? Like, <laughs> where does that go? <laughs> It's the yeah. ultimate purgatory. Yeah, 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 but I think it's supposed to do that so that you end up, it, it, it kicks you out of that linear time in the end, and, and maybe that's what it's really all about. Um, yeah, when I was exploring that, um, and, and, so I was, and so I was learning about um, um, thermodynamics and all this kind of thing, that was everything that I learned there. Um, you know, I put on that, uh, a big sort of a serpent song line and I carved it into uh, this thing here. And so I ended up, I put this uh, kind of Ouroboros on there, but he's going around this 3D object. There, see? And it, because I did it like a Rainbow Snake East Coast one, um, like I didn't want to curse it by making it actually eat the tail, so I like stopped short of that. <laughs> but yeah, the secret in this one is not in the image on the club, it's the image that the club makes when you... Um, uh, roll it across clay. So I like I'll put this clay out in a big circle and Then I roll that over the clay and it leaves an imprint of that snake there But then the next one so what you end up is the truth of that Of what place time is which is in the end um, you have this image of this endless sort of line circle of snakes just head to tail mm. So it's just this procession of serpents and where one is ending, the next is beginning and they all just linked up back around to the start, which is cool. But every time I've done it, cause you can't, I mean, you think you have to do a lot of calculations to make sure that, um, you know, the last snake is going to line up with the, the tip of the tail of the first one when you finish the circle. But every time I've done it, it's, it's just worked out just fine somehow and i probably i probably should be i don't know using pi or something for that to make it work is that pi that you'd use for that i think so the the best best description of of pi i heard was from an illiterate settler farmer who was like um we, we were we were getting i was helping him lift barrels of molasses off his truck and he had to roll them up onto the onto the casing you know so he'd, he'd sort of chainsawed you know logs so that they the barrels could sit in there and he was getting it and moving it into place and then rolling it up onto the logs and it land so that the the tap was perfectly centered to the ground and i said like ah oh, how are you doing that so this is someone he he never even finished like you know, his third year of schooling as a kid, like he just never went to school, you know? <laughs> so he didn't have any math, so he couldn't read. And he just said, yeah, well, you know, a, a barrel is about, barrel's always about three times it's wide. <laughs> the barrel roll. <laughs> so he'd figured out, figured out that one. And, um, you know, he's doing all kinds of cool stuff with shadow reckoning with trees. When he was when he was cutting them down to make those little stands as well um getting a bit of pythagoras going and didn't even know it which is cool because like um i think it was aristotle was it aristotle or socrates who was talking about um just by asking questions getting uh um pythagoras out of a stable boy or something like that <clears throat> which is 
probably a lot more ethical than getting Pythagoras into a stable boy, which is, um, you know, also a thing, ancient Greece. So um, they had that, Aristotle had that telos idea, right? That, uh, that sort of end point, the principle of everything is change and it's, it's inevitable end. You know, so there was that original idea of, um, yeah, that, that kind of each being, each item being a thing unto itself. Um, you know, all the sort of stoic stuff that you know came out that Marcus Aurelius was writing about later. You know, that, uh, um, what do they call it, the first principles? Mm -hmm. The first principle seems to be predicated on the last principles. Uh, of, a, of an action of a process of a being um yeah so i don't know so i i, I just enjoyed playing around with all those physics but in the end it's um <clears throat> it's enclosures that does it because basically our reality is more like the first law of 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 uh, thermodynamics so the law of the land is you know that's the first law of the first peoples and that lines up pretty I don't know, poetically, neatly with that first law of thermodynamics, um, which Charles Darwin also said is, would be a better model of time. Um, <laughs> the idea that we don't inhabit discrete systems, um, that all of these systems overlap and are interconnected and we live in, you know, infinitely um, uh, connective and interconnected systems that are constantly exchanging matter, energy, um, you know, and there's closed loops where one system's entropy is another system's lunch, you know, so your lunch becomes entropy <laughs> in your gut, which you, um, you know, have to put somewhere. And <clears throat> if you are living in a closed loop and, you know, in relation with the other systems around you, not just the system of your body, then, then that is supposed to go, uh, into the ground where you grow in your beans and corn and squash or whatever. I'm doing a turtle island diet for you, you, you lot of years over there, <laughs> Turtle Island. Is how you, how else are you going to get your protein since you killed all the buffalo? So let's take the enclosure thread um, because I think what you're describing what is called the um, the the ancient Greek method, which is dialogic thinking, hmm. which is uh is really was privileged then and is privileged now when we mm. talk about futures one of the things that um we're struggling with is who has this who has this capacity um to imagine the future and is there an is there a um how do we create the spaces that are shared spaces that actually create a dialogic possibility for everyone to be able to imagine yeah well it's tricky it's um because it, it comes down to narrative i mean that's how you organize your life there's that part of your brain which is the storyteller they, they know it exists in the same way that they they knew black hole exists before they actually saw one <laughs> you know what i mean because mathematically it must be there there's some part of your brain that they haven't found yet that organizes your life into a story you know where you constantly there's part of you that's self-narrating the whole time it's just there, like, you know, in a world where it's just happening. Um, you know, you're the star of your own film kind of thing. Um, yeah. So it's, it's stories that, uh, yeah, it's the stories that do it. And the problem is that, you know, um, because stories are just, they're, they're commodities now. They're like marketable items that you make one up and then that's your IP and that gets enclosed that gets with with packaging and with uh zoning restrictions and with uh dates and you know uh who's getting royalties and all that sort of thing it gets enclosed in that so you know your stories are discrete and your story must have a beginning middle and end mm. and it can be like interoperable with other texts you, you can have that um and but you know that's usually in a a set enclosure to like you know a uh, trilogy or something like this <laughs> you know um, um, yeah so so usually yeah if there's a series then it's like uh, you know well there's a season there um, you know if it's TV etc and then you get 
first season, second th season, third season, all that kind of thing. So there are kind of enclosures around the stories, which which really doesn't help because they need to they need to kind of interact. Um, yes. You know, so I guess it's it's how your narratives are working and how much diversity you have in those narratives. Um, and I guess you only know it's truly opened up if you don't have to receive that story with a beginning, middle and end, mm. you know, with this, that Aristotelian kind of, you know, uh, structure to it. You know, if, um, see that, um, I'm, how I know Brolga's story, which is my totem, my, like how I, how I know that is never, I've never heard the whole thing from beginning to end, mm. just sort of told there isn't a sort of, you know, and now we hear the story of the Brolga kind of thing. Long, long time ago, you know, when you hear, it doesn't happen like that. Mm. It's like, you know, you're, you're fishing somewhere and it's like, oh yeah, that's that oyster reef there. That's his body where that finish, where he died there. Mm. Um, you know, and it's like, yeah, that's where he come across from uh, over there with Pidenhead. And he got that red there from the, um, Yuk Yonk, that the ironwood tree, that's where that come from there. So when you cut that Kimway, ironwood, eh, you know, and, and that's it. That's the bit that you get there mm -hmm. because that's your context. That's how you know to be in that place and spearing those crabs uh, at the beach at dawn at, at that time, time place right there. And so you get that part of the story there. I have all the story, but it's these pieces, you know, and it's not beginning, middle, end. It's like this uh, fabric, you know, time, place, fabric of, of me, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and actually, I think because it's as hard as it is to do this, we're, we're going to pause the conversation and let people go into breakout rooms and then come yeah, back. Yeah. This is a good point, Dan, if you're comfortable with doing it, because I actually think um, I'm thinking about the prompt for the, the groups in talking about it is... Uh, what is a story that you've assumed has a beginning, middle, and end? And Beautiful. how would it change your perceptions if it was open? Mm. That's, a, that's a great question. And another, another question could be um, around playing with this idea of closed systems and how it relates to... Um, orienting towards regenerative. We'll formulate that into a question and we'll share it into your breakout rooms. Welcome back, everyone. I've seen all your faces pop up. Okay, we'd love to hear from a couple of you just so we can get a sense in the larger group what was what was spoken about in your breakouts and what are the themes that are resonating with you? So if anyone just wants to share something that's, you know, standing out to them or piquing their curiosity, we'd love to hear it. You can just unmute yourself and speak. Hey, I'll share. Is... Oh, go, go ahead, James. A story that I always thought had a start, middle, and end, uh, and this is until Tyson's book actually started me thinking differently. It was just my life. I thought it started at birth, and there was the middle part, which I'm living, which hopefully I'm maybe still before the middle, uh, and then it ended. But um, it got me thinking about it a whole different way, and it seemed like the my two colleagues in my group felt very similarly as well. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that uh, I was really touched by one of the people in my group who shared the example of how the her dream her dreams are being influenced by reading your book Tyson and how the the dreams from the dream world are influencing her story. Mm. It's really uh, just such a special share. Really appreciated it. That's amazing. Mm. But that time runs different too on that side yeah different time place baby that's it <laughs> uh so i have to admit i was in thinking about this question i was like i don't think of myself as having a beginning middle and end i just am mm. and it's like oh is that good or bad i don't know what the heck have i know 
uh, and uh, and then you know it's, I do all these things in the world like all of us, right? You do all this stuff, and uh, and that stuff always has kind of a it's like you do stuff, but you really probably I feel I have no idea what happens, and that stuff has a life, and it goes, and maybe I touch it again, like it happened in our group. Uh, and, uh, and it's like, huh? So some of those things are like going along, and then whoa, they come back again. Whoa, they go on along. Whoa, mm. some of it. And it's like that's kind of how I experience like what life is like. Mm. Thank you. It's Liz. Um... One of the things that was quite fascinating in our conversation is actually how the two questions overlapped and the recognition of trying to put a story with the beginning, middle and end becoming actually an enclosed system itself and how how we're lying to ourselves in that process um, and that it's completely contrary to regeneration um, so it was it was really quite a beautiful awareness that came through that mm. thanks Liz I love how that is all interwoven so we'd love to be able to hear from more of you but for time's sake let's get back into the dialogue with Tyson mm. <laughs> yeah well so you know we have in um uh, most of our original languages the there's no separate words for time and uh time and place hmm. so you know um yeah so i might say like like um what time but literally that means what place hmm. so arc is place you know and Nien, what place what that's what time like kinchwangana uh, Kinchwangana, like um, sunset, you know, at sunset, uh, at that uh, place, <laughs> you know. Um, so that sunrise, sunset, dreaming, um, that's, you know, that's place, that's placial as well as, you know, temporal. Um, yeah. And so I, and I use place rather than space because, you know, space is what, um, what we're in right now. Like weirdly, we have this kind of, bipolar thing going on this this weirdness where each of us is in place but you know our awareness and uh, our relationships somehow are not in place you know in the zoom they're in they're in space <laughs> um, you know, yeah which is interesting because um you know distance doesn't really affect that those relational connections and that placiality um you know, for indigenous people, um, mostly. And, you know, so I found myself knocked out of that relation with all these Zooms, you know, but then, um, so I'm communicating with elders though in Turtle Island and we're communicating in lots of different ways, you know, um, and they don't really mind about the distance, you know, um, and so sort of I had this idea of, I don't know, so we use smoke a lot in our, you know starting and ending kind of ceremonies and and i was kind of wondering if it would possibly be possible to do digital smoking um for a long time but um yeah the elders at the turtle island institute that were you know they were putting smoke to start off this big zoom meeting you know and i was like ah well that's like you know that smoke's not gonna translate into there's no standardized protocol for that you know, there's no interface where, like, you're going to translate those, those, the operating system of smoke, <laughs> you know, and bring it across to this one. Um, but then all of a sudden I could smell the smoke. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Like I could smell it and it was there. And I was like, what did you do? Like, have you got like, I don't know, coders or something like, <laughs> you know, digitally twinning this, these leaves or what the hell's happening? How are you like translating that across? And they went, oh no, it has nothing to do with the, you know, we're there with you. You know, it's, there's that uh, connection in real place. Um, yeah. So yeah. somehow you, 
somehow you, you go past this one. So you're speaking into this one, but your awareness is still in place and place time, you know, <laughs> which is, you know, it, which is really interesting because that's moving across multiple sunrises and sunsets, um, you know, but somehow still connecting relationally across place. It's really tricky, that one. Yeah, that's incredible and very true. Yeah. And I'm glad that you bring that up because from the previous conversation, you got me thinking about, you know, if we take on this perspective of time, how does that impact how we show up in relationship with each other and other life forms in the earth? Mm. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And really, yeah, and that's huge because that's, that's really the only prepping that is effective or useful. You know, if you do stay prepping, then you're, you need to be working on your relationships. You know, you need to have a, a, a go bag of relationships locally, <laughs> you know, rather than, you know, a box of matches and a hatchet and your passports <laughs> ready to roll. You've got to have those local relationships there that are, you know, um, basically that already have the in infrastructure of an emergent sort of section of supply chain you know organic demotic supply chain <laughs> that could be deployed within you know a short time um you know following a disaster so you find that in places like argentina and um you know bosnia and and th these sorts of places you know the first people to die were the people who had you know bunkers and you know survivalist stocked up log cabins out in the countryside and the mountains and all that sort of thing because you know there's bandits <laughs> that go through the countryside like immediately in an apocalypse and um and like all the preppers are the first to die you know um you know and yeah <clears throat> or to become slaves or you know whatever else the people who seem to do well are the people uh, the urban people who have good strong community and who are able to be you know, uh, mobile, but have networks of support. Um, they seem to do well. And so, you know, when Argentina went, psh, that's, um, those were the people who did well, you know, um, yeah. And a lot of Eastern European countries, you hear reports of that one as well. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, back to place and time, um, with regard to re regeneration. Um, you know, and how important story is there, you know, you know um, as you were, <clears throat> as you were finishing up in the, in the last session, Tyson, I just had to kind of quiet myself down a little bit and say, so what the hell, what the hell am I feeling out of everything that you've been saying? And, and what came to me was this this really strong sense of how we're living out of time, out of story, mm. and in a landscape of confusion. Mm. And, and I, you know, so we started this next session, I, wanted, I was going to ask, you know, so what the hell do we do about that? And then I just, because every once in a while, I try and look back at my notes, I, 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 I saw that what we wanted to get into in this next session was actually what emerges from disaster mm. and I sort of went shit that's what disaster is it's when we're out of time out of story and in a landscape of confusion mm. which seems to be very much the space that we're individually and collectively occupying mm. now uh, well um, what it's it's these disasters what they what they seem to be is temporary disruptions to the enclosures so that that chaos, chaos that, that you're perceiving is actually the systems opening up and interacting. Oh, totally, totally. You know, and, and initially it's, I mean, it's like, you know, tipping a, a substance, you know, into a clear glass of water and there's that swirl initially before it sort of comes into an equilibrium there, you know, yeah. You know, it, it's like one of the, uh, one of the strong experiences that I had in Japan 10 years ago after the triple mm. disasters was mm. that there was the what one of the things that was going on energetically for people was there was this deep sense 
of we've been released from a future we did not want. Mm. And it's and a, then a, amazing. Yeah, totally. Mm. And and then all this pressure to get back to what we didn't want that's still there. But there's yeah. this there's this opening. There's this possibility. Yeah. That how and 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 I think part of our work now, whether it's in the pandemic or in the bushfires or you know, name your disaster. Our, our opportunity now is to figure out how to not reconstruct those enclosures. Our opportunity is to figure out how to live in mm. that opening mm. and find our way into a future that we actually mm. want, that we can't see. Yeah. But that we yearn for. And the, the relationality of place time is really important to that. So seeing yourself instead of being on a continuum, you know, of ancestors and de descendants that you are in relation you're in relation all the time with your ancestors in communication with them but also with your descendants yeah. you know your descendants are part of that field so you always i mean you know like good futurists are, are the ones who are looking at the current century but then the you know the three or four or two preceding ones and the next ones you know and, and sort of seeing that as a as a as a holistic thing you know um yeah what what have you been learning about what i mean what helps you keep that awareness that sense of continuum ah oh, that that nothing i'm i'm completely losing it <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting knocked out of that every day. Every now and then I'm forced into it, but it's, it is disasters, you know? So, um, um, uh, so an elder male, male relative, um, you know, patrilineal side, um, you know, so he, um, you know, there's been disruptions because of different plants that have been built on, um, you know, for bauxite processing, and shipping and all that sort of stuff and massive bauxite mines on country uh, there's been story places that have been disturbed you know and these are time places these are you know places of overlap between sky camp and earth camp these are really sacred places um, that are eternal they're, they're t timeless places you know you have to do things to protect yourself before you go into those places because there are entities there that don't exist in time and and you might lose part of yourself in there and you come out and just be a living ghost, you know. There's really, you know, dangerously spiritual places and they're just building things on them and just eradicating them. There's a death adder site that's just uh, been obliterated, you know, um, recently, which is horrifying. Death adders like these tiny little snakes that'll like kill you in five minutes. Um, you see, if, if you can imagine the big dreaming entity for that, I would, you know, it's like, oh, what, you know, I would start this up, but make jobs for indigenous people, and none of them want to work here. Lazy. It's like <laughs> nobody wants to go there. It's like, fuck that. I'm not going there. Um, you know, but so anyway, this uh, old fellow, he's, he's got a knock um, from uh, Ngulmunka, a story place that I'm connected to through the Brogger story. Um, it's called Moving Stone. There's a stone there. That every time you go, it's in a different place because it just moves itself around. Uh, so it's called Moving Stone. And yeah, that came on a whirlwind from China. So that whirlwind itself was part of the totemic relation in there. But he got he got knocked uh, from this imbalance that happened uh, where he's a custodian there for that really big, powerful story. That place is so terrible, you can't stay there overnight. If you do, you'd just be dead. You know, so it's a very powerful place that, that he was looking after for a long time. But he got a knock from a, a tiger shark spirit entity displaced from another place that was disrupted and come in there and he got knocked in his sleep from that. And that just completely, it's completely messed him up. There isn't a word for the pathology there where you know so it's like twist so his hand these two fingers have just shrunk back to stubs and then these two fingers are now about a foot long and his thumb you know he's just mutated his arm has turned into 
you know, in, um, you know, what's that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie where he's on Mars, Total Recall? You know that guy who takes off his prosthetic thing and then whoosh, that big limb just folds out? It looks like that, you know. So he can't even live near, can't, he has, he's had to move away and, and stay like 500 kilometers away. He can't go near there now. Um, yeah. And I guess a uh, long way around what keeps me <laughs> in relation is usually horrible disasters. So my niece calling me up uh, yesterday morning screaming, you know, because that old fellow, he's just fallen over in the kitchen and, you know, his shin bones sticking out through his flesh and there's blood everywhere and he's knocked half his teeth out, you know, and they're trying to figure out how to clean up all that blood because there's other disturbances where there's all kinds of people you know doing like black magic and cursing each other it's like this just a it's a it's just warfare at the moment you know the whole community just torn apart there's massive upheavals and there's like all kinds of black magic going around and so you can't leave any blood anywhere because someone will get it and they'll curse you and so they're trying to you know balance the need to get the ambulance there and get into hospital and and doing first aid to try and stop the bleeding but also make sure that you know someone's keeping an eye on all that blood and she's traumatized she's screaming and i'm trying to talk her through it on the phone um and i'm back in my place time again <laughs> you know it's, it's either that or canadian indigenous people giving me a digital smoking but like only one of those two things it's like <laughs> there's nothing in between it's either complete horror or or something sublime uh going on um and that's where it's wrong because it's the mundane you know that's supposed to put you in your place time you know but i only get there through extremes at the moment because my mundane takes me out of it now the earth the big mother she's given us a big slap She's slapped most of the world's population back into a, a sense of place, time and an awareness of it. And that's most of the people on the planet, except for those of us who are operating in a knowledge economy. And those of us who are operating in the knowledge economy, we've, we've created a tech fix from the virus that was supposed to put us back into place, time again, you know? Um, so most people are forced to you know come back into their local and most people are forced to uh, cement their relationships and to do what they need to do to survive and to build community relationships in that disaster as most of the people in the world but in the knowledge economy we've further rendered subjective our individualized sort of packages of time you know we are able to so we're talking to musa before in the break you know and it's 1 30 in the morning there for him he's in bed in this webinar <laughs> you know um yeah i i have to do things at two o'clock in the morning um and this room always looks the same the curtains are closed this these lights are on and i'm positioned here in the frame um so my place time is it's not it's placeless and it's also weirdly timeless and so there isn't that so we're in this knowledge economy we've created an enclosure and a little uh, proto metaverse you know um you know 1.0 <laughs> um you know enclosure bubble entropic bubble um that we can inhabit here and get on with the business of um our knowledge economy work and I don't know about you, but I'm working twice as many hours in that as I was before. You know, you might do three, four conferences a year, tops, you know, unless there's some local ones. But the ones you travel for, you know, it's it's a big event and it takes a couple of weeks out of your life. <laughs> and you go to that conference and you make relationships and, you know, and you have to deal with the consequences of, you know, of, of doing that. Um, that's that's how it's been for many years and then all of a sudden instead I'm doing three or four of them a day you know um, across multiple time zones and yeah. sunrise sunset dreamings and um, and I've just completely eliminated you know, all these communities knowledge knowledge economy communities have completely eliminated both place and time 
And so now we're kind of, yeah, in this entropic vacuum, well, enclosure I sort of space. And we're separate from the real world because most of the people on the planet are not in that. <laughs> and But we're sitting here and saying, oh, yeah, humans, yeah, we're all... Uh, we're all living online. We're all working from home now. We're working from home and we're online. And we're, we're uh, you know, this is great. <laughs> it's like, well, no, that's not the humans. That's just uh, this tiny minority of people. Mm. Yeah, I think, you know, what I'd add to that, though, is that... Uh, uh, This, this right now is real and it's totally unreal and it's not going to be here for much longer. <clears throat> I mean, we're so much, you know, part of, part of the invitation I think that we're in is we either figure out how we go forward from where we are now or, you know, maybe hell is getting imprisoned in this virtual yep. reality for the rest of our lives because we're sure not going back to what it was before, you know, like. So there, is, for me, there's something really hopeful about people in Tokyo or people outside of Tokyo saying, uh, um, you know, I'm just not going to go back to spending an hour and a half in the morning and an hour and a half in the afternoon traveling to that damn job that I didn't want to be doing anyway. That's done. We're done with that. And I don't know what it is that I'm going to do or how I'm going to do it, but I'm not going back there. You know, it's like part of this disruption of the pandemic is a number of people saying, if we go back to that story without, without beginning, middle, or end, people saying, I'm not going back to that story that I was in, and I don't know what story I'm going forward into, but it's not going to be that old one. And so we've got this period of disruption. I think part of what's gone on with the amount of... of uh, uh, connecting across the planet that's gone on with Zoom is people who have been able to reaching out to one another saying, what the fuck? Hmm. Nice. Tyson, I'd, I'd love to hear, so if these disasters kind of provide a crack so that we can get back to place time, what do you see emerging through the current cracks? of the current disasters that we face? What what possibilities? Hmm. Oh, well, what, what's exciting is the, um, you know, how quickly, how quickly people uh, return to their kind of feral um, sort of human patterning, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, what it is that we do. And, and we are this sort of relational custodial species. And we look after our place and we look after each other and we're never, ever happier than when we're doing that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, every species it's um is never happier than when it's doing what its pattern you know has it doing in its in its habitat <laughs> doing things the right way you know it, it might seem really boring and all that sort of thing but it's just bliss you know and you, you keep seeing I mean there's that great book I've just started reading it come out because I've been saying this for a long time people said oh that sounds like mutual aid activism what you're talking about so i started looking that up and and there is a book it's um some something like um paradise in hell or, or something oh, like paradise that. built in hell yeah paradise built in hell yeah <laughs> um yeah i'm so i'm not even going to get into it because because she does it a hell of a lot better than me um you know um really great really great storytelling around um around these dis disasters and how freaking happy people are um, even if they've lost everything, even if they're grieving and everything else, they're still in this, you know, confused by this state of bliss that they're in yeah. of just, and, and it, it, it really is, it's just temporarily having these enclosures removed okay. and suddenly, you know, you're able to exist in that time, place of relation, uh, what you might call action relation, Norm Sheehan calls it, uh, Professor Norm Sheehan is an indigenous thinker in Australia. Um, yeah, you're in that action relation um, where you're just doing what you do, what you're patterned to do, which is, you know, all about sharing. It's non-hierarchical. It's about, um, 
you know, sharing, giving, receiving, you know, cementing relationships. And, um, you know, even if there's a severe shortage and everybody's rationing, it's, um, there is this kind of feeling of abundance and um, also the outcomes of abundance. You know, people are healthier, people are, <laughs> are doing really well um, in these situations, even when they're, you know, they're being shot by the military that's been sent into the disaster zone to stop the bloody, you know, the rabble. Oh, there must be like all these people will just, you know, without the rule of law, they must all just be going crazy and, and just raping and killing and, and looting. So, you know, we've got to go in there and protect them from themselves. And, you know, so you've got people trying to, you know, fight the fires that are about to burn their house down and, and you've got soldiers shooting them. <laughs> <laughs> to stop them from doing that you know uh, you've got people like feeding hu the hungry and the poor and 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 helping out the injured and the soldiers are coming in and shutting that down because it's not um you know oh and s approved <laughs> kind of thing you know um yeah even in the middle of all that you know with those complications and you know that um that really forcible you know top down trying to make sure that this does not stick this this emergent community does not stick um because that's not what disasters are for for those elites disasters are for leveraging land grabs and for um you know uh, getting you know being able to fast track gentrification of of you know the um communities uh, the, the real estate of the marginal yeah you know part of part of the dilemma is that that um that spirit of, of, of sharing and that spirit of community uh, um, after disaster often uh, uh, ends up being short-lived. And we start, get, we start getting afraid at this whole other level of, oh, you know, what if all these people that have been sharing with me decide they're not gonna do that anymore, I better I better start building my own. I better start creating my own enclosure again. And and this pull that's there, this pull to to return to the old normal, even if I didn't like it. Uh, uh, I think the the big the big challenge that I found in in communities that have uh, uh, have had significant disasters is how do we how do we help each other stay awake enough to move towards something that we can't see rather than letting our fear enclose us and draw us back to what we know even if we don't like it. Mm. I'm going to I'm going to interrupt this enclosure <laughs> by inviting in some of the other voices in the room and I'm going to do a further Beautiful. enclosure disruption by suggesting that we hear first from female voices in the room who may want to speak. Um, and there's there's been some really um, wonderful sharings in the chat as well about this turning towards heart centeredness. So who would who would like to share kind of a question with Tyson or maybe an insight of what is coming up? Disrupting enclosures, yeah. I think I have one. Um, you know, in so many of these spaces that I'm in, and I love that you invited the feminine because I think that I'm always looking for what brings us into balance. And so much of what I find in these spaces is, and, and I'm pretty good at it too, you know, and, and just having it be this theoretical kind of discussion instead of really sinking into the embodiment. You know, I'm mm -hmm. always left with the, so what? Like, okay, we can say all this stuff and we know all this stuff, but, you know, I said, I think one of the things I put in the chat is that um, we're a culture that loves to study spirit and doesn't have a clue how to live it. You know, how do we move into the embodiment? And I think it's the feminine. You know, um, one of the pieces that um, that I've been working on is this piece around what does it take to init for initiation? You know, Melodoma Somme, 
um, from West Africa in Burkina Faso says that in the West, in lieu of initiation, what we've done is called up trauma instead. Mm. Because the soul mm. knows it needs to be initiated. Yeah. And if we don't have practices and, and ways to take people through, we have to get initiated in some way. And mm. so um, just that piece about how do you invite in maybe the feminine in your own life is a question I, I guess I would have. Mm. I, yeah. Well, for me, that's that's not my business. That's for the women um, that I'm in relation with and who, um, you know, very much mm, run things, <laughs> um, you know, in my family. Um, that's for them. Um, that's for them to lay out for me. It's, yeah, I think yeah. that's different. In it's, the it's weird though. because, I mean, it's, yeah. uh, I don't know. I, so I can't, you know, make space for women. It's like, I'm going to create the space for you to come in and, and create, you know, it's like, oh my God, the arrogant, like, you know, I wouldn't know what that space would have to look like. That's yeah. like, um, you know, and I usually in our way, if, if women are not speaking, mm -hmm. then that means they're doing something else. And, um, that either means they're cooking up something you're going to cop it later or, um, <laughs> <laughs> and get a flogging after the meeting or you know it means that what's happening right now is not the real meeting yeah, yeah. That, and i that didn't they're, say they're organizing that for women. somewhere else <laughs> yeah, I didn't yeah so I, i've got no advice on that space for the feminine which is different to yeah me. Oh, you know yeah. i mean i can make my own space <laughs> um but yeah. but i think that piece about the feminine that lives in each of us because yeah. i think what we've done is we've um we don't have a good balance. You know, we hear a mm. lot these days about toxic masculinity, but you can't have mm. toxic masculinity and not have toxic femininity. So yeah. I wonder about in each of us internally, how do mm. we balance mm. our own masculine and feminine? Yeah, but that's in our relations. That's external. It's you have to have that balance in your relations um, for that to work. Yeah. Um, oh, that's masculinity, femininity only becomes toxic in enclosures. It becomes entropic like everything else. So if the masculine is is separated from the feminine and enclosed over there, you know, then it's, but um, so for me, I, I don't get to, and, and so what I was answering, it was that personal question, you know, of, of my, you know, my own femininity. That's not, that's not my business. My, so my expressions of femininity and my coming into the feminine is um, that's by invitation only. Um, that, and that's determined by the women in my life and it's usually you know and and they never tell you the big plan of it it's lots of little instructions you know it's do that now uh -huh. you know um all right that. you're on deck for the next 12 hours i'm taking off um <laughs> you know so you have to do all these things and you know um you know you're not wiping the benches enough i'm like i just wiped it Shit, I wiped it six times today. You've you wiped it once this week. What are you even talking about? It's like, shut up, smack. That's feminine. <laughs> and that's determining what, what femininity I take I take on. Um, but yeah, it is it is different. Um, we have different conceptions of femininity and masculinity too. So, you know, um, manhood, uh, you know, and maleness. You know, in my culture, there's a lot of um, uh, nurturance involved in that. And there's a lot of ritual, ritual things that, you know, are associated with, you know, symbolic birthing and things like that, that we go through as well. Um, but yeah, going back briefly to the, I mean, you said it was really important what you said about those rites of passage. And, and I think you hit the nail on the head with the fact that modernity, um, um, it honors the ordeal part of that. You know, it, we have, <laughs> you know, we all have that ordeal. You know, that's supposed to make us stronger and more resilient and you know we're doing breath work to get through that and all that sort of thing but um th there's no meaning making there's no collective meaning making rituals that come with that and if you don't have that you know following the ordeal and during the ordeal then um it's it's not only incomplete it's it's damaging it's as you say it just becomes trauma you know, which is damage without meaning is, is basically what, what trauma is. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm.
I love that. I love the Beautiful. piece around. I'm going to sit with this piece around the the women and the feminine, because I think there is a way that the women invite in um, with men and with women, the feminine, that yeah. there is a way to hold it. I think part of what um, the learning, especially in the US, I think in the West, is mm. um, how do you like in a culture that has such little community that has this whole idea, this myth of independence, how do you then hold the the feminine the the women to hold the feminine it's you know it's uh it's tricky <laughs> yeah um, especially if structurally your society is yeah. a patriarchy yes yeah it's Thank awful <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i think we're doing some you know but it's it's uh yeah. it's, it's but uh, that's it's whenever the enclosures are disrupted we just start yeah. doing it you know, yeah. it yeah. just, if you look at Katrina, what all the news reports were talking about, you know, um, you know, uh, all I heard about was gang rapes mm -hmm. and, and murder. And, but then when I found out later, that was all made up, that didn't happen. You know, the gang members were doing security for everybody. And there was one attempted sexual assault, you know, in that big stadium <laughs> that everyone was in. And, you know, everybody beat the shit out of that guy. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. Men and women just wailed on him, <laughs> finished him off. Yeah. It was the just an attempted it. assault. You know what I mean? We take care of that together when we're released from the enclosure from a minute for a minute, and we go into our normal patterning as human beings. And like, God, oh, man, you know, all of these constructs just melt away in, in that time, and and they're becoming increasingly irrelevant. I made I made a point earlier perhaps controversial that whiteness is is becoming a, a really um, inaccurate heuristic to describe a lot of things um, in this world um, and that it would you would have been very useful four decades ago it would have been very useful then but um, you know I, I think for <laughs> for most people it's 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 inaccurate in describing what people are and where they are and what they're doing um, you know, so in this time place, it's, um, it's, it's less helpful, but I, I don't think we have a, a better heuristic to move into is the problem, um, which is really upsetting. Like I was saying, when I was trying to, I was trying to, um, figure out how to, you know, uh, this idea of, uh, what did I say? Like, uh, Western hierarchical industrialized technocratic elites, um, I wish there was a shorter way to say that. It was like a bit of a joke. Um, <laughs> but that's no longer an accurate or helpful joke, you know, which is annoying because it's really good. <laughs> this is, I think many of us would uh, want to keep going in this conversation. I recognize also that we set a time boundary for this. I'd like to, um, for those that have to leave, because I know a few people have, uh, have dropped off. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for being in this space with us, for making this an incredibly rich uh, conversation. We have seven more of these planned over the next three months. Uh, you can see them all on the Solvable website. Each one will be entirely different by design, different partners, different structure, different uh, authors. That is the magic of this, that what has transpired has been through the generous gifts of everything that everyone has brought here. And I want to thank in particular New Stories, and I want to thank Tyson for everything that you have brought into this space. and. May in particular, but also everybody for being here with us. So uh, if you do have a few minutes to stay, Tyson, if you're still good for a few minutes um, to have a close, mm. uh, that would be great. And we'll leave, we'll give you the floor mm. to, to have a close. Unless Bob and Jen, did you want to say anything or May before we turn it over to Tyson? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I find it, I find it helpful if you, I, I speak better if you set up a women's space that I can that I can then sort of come in and talk over the top of. Um, I'm more motivated <laughs> if you do that. You can just start talking I, and then you can interrupt now. Maybe, you maybe you know. we should let the women close who were supposed to be able to speak in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
And if you, someone did an Arundhati Roy, Roy, Roy quote, if you get her in, I'll come in your audience Brilliant. there. I want to... Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, David, thank you. So um, thank you, everyone. We will, uh, Tyson, I'm going to turn the spotlight to you if you want to do the um, reading as a close. And Ooh, uh, yeah, and that for, one. Okay. For anyone, um, anyone that has to drop off, uh, we will record this part too. So thank you, mm. everyone, for being here. And <clears> while, <throat> while, um, while we're sharing uh, the reading, feel free <clears throat> in the chat that's uh that's arisen for you today and yeah thank you so i'm gonna mm. bring the spotlight to you Tyson. all right um all right let's go so um you might find yourself in a story now in a place of totemic relation with the water lilies that grow near a river the seeds from that lily have been ground to make bread for tens of thousands of years you and the lilies are kin, and you two are being moved into a season of abundance following a period of heavy rain. The land is moving you in its annual cycles, directing you towards diets and activities that you need to be healthy and complete. But there are longer cycles at play here too. Nearby, there's a particular tree that only fruits once or twice in a century, and it is in full bloom right now. You've never seen this before in your lifetime, but the old people with you remember it. Under that tree, a crocodile is nesting, so we all avoid that part of the river today, and a dozen of your nephews and nieces are splashing in the shallows on a different riverbank, where the old people say it's safe this morning, but not tomorrow morning. The strange new story of fight or flight that is associated with Paleolithic life is absent here, because you all know where the predators are, always. They are your relations. <clears throat> the last time the old people saw that tree flowering at the crocodile's nest was also the last time a dugout canoe was made in this place. The old people want to make sure everyone remembers how to do this. So that is why you all are here today. While the children play, some people are casting nets for bait fish, while others are loading up a rusty barge with water, tools and hand lines for fishing. Soon everyone's crowded on board, along with the dogs, and you're on your way inland to the canoe tree the old people have been carefully selecting for this day. <coughs> on the way, you all stop to pick up some aunties, who have been collecting shellfish and crabs in the mangroves. They show you where to stop there, and the authority in the group shifts to a grandmother who advises you all during this leg of the journey, because this part of the river is her place. She sits with you a while, and you too watch a porpoise at play while she tells you its story. It's called Otmat which she tells you is an old word that came from an international trading relationship with Indonesia a long time ago. She also tells you that this historical trading relation with New Guinea and Indonesia influenced the design of the canoe that you all are going to make today. <coughs> Around a few river bends and the authority shifts again to the man who speaks for the place where the canoe tree lives. But the group doesn't follow his instructions right away, as there are white birds diving into the river near the far bank. So you all know that there are fat white fish feeding in that spot too. Everyone decides to go fish there for a while to get more food for later. Some split off and move to the river bank to make a fire and cook some of those white fish. Eventually they return and the river moves you all further inland. On the last leg of the journey, you sit with your nephew and teach him the names of a dozen orchids growing in the mangroves. It's the first time he's noticed these plants, but now that he knows their names, he will see them every time. Soon the barge lands at the site of the canoe tree and everyone splits off to do whatever they like. Your young cousin chases a puppy with a stick and then goes all sooky when you growl at him. You and your siblings fish for brim, 
and you leave your line in just a bit too long. So an aquatic file snake grabs the brim you've hooked and you get a two for one deal on your lunch. Aunties begin collecting shiny red seeds for decorating cultural objects and you realize that these seeds have been used for thousands of years for birth control. This doesn't sit well with what your teachers at school told you about modern medicine recently liberating women for the first time in human history with the invention of the birth control pill. You take turns with the axe to fell the canoe tree. A few swings, then pass it on. It's trimmed and cut to size and then tied to the barge while you eat the file snake and the brim <laughs> and hear the story of her part, that file snake, Tintoa, in the tale of Taipan and the blue tongue lizard. The places in that story find their way into your mental map of that country as you all pack up and head for home, dragging the canoe tree behind. Back at the water lily place, you eat crabs for dinner and feel a tap on your shoulder and turn to see that nobody is there. The shoulder is the corresponding body part for your father-child relation, so you worry about your dad. Someone drives up from town and you get the news that he's all, he's all right, but he's not happy that you took his spear this morning without letting him know. You look around for that spear, but somebody borrowed it from you at lunchtime, and after that you lost track of where it went. Oops. There's gonna be trouble with your dad later. Next morning, the old men start shaping the canoe with axes, digging it out and burning it out with fire. You watch for a long time until you definitely know how to do it, then join in. There's no trial and error here, no learning from mistakes. You either know how to do something or you don't. And you learn it by listening and looking in perfect ways. It is the same learning process when you go with a select kin group, us only, to cut the oars and outrigging in the mangroves. The mangrove is a naturally perfect shape for an oar and it doesn't take many cuts to finish it. Mangroves and oar have the same name, a strange sounding word that doesn't feel like it fits with your language, pemar. And you wonder if this is also a word that came from overseas trade many thousands of years ago. Next day the canoe is finished and this is the time for the children. There are dozens there now, paddling the canoe in the shallows and doing backflips off it, and laughing and screaming. This is the best part. The family uses the canoe from time to time over the next few months. But then it's collected and placed on display in an institution that owns it now. Insects start eating it from the inside out. And its new owners spray it with chemicals to preserve it. But too late. It needs to be living and in regular use in fresh and salt water to stop the insects from eating it away. It soon crumbles to sawdust and anthropologists write a research paper lamenting the demise of the last canoe. They don't get it. The canoe is not a belonging. The belonging is in the relationships that were strengthened in the canoe's making and the knowledge processes of a thousand activities that were demonstrated and passed on to the next generation at the same time for the next 50 year cycle of that flowering tree. As long as the relationships last, the maps and blueprints of the canoe will remain as living knowledge that will outlast all the books and all the servers that might try to capture this story. Relationships are the only way to store data safely in the long term. That wasn't a very spiritual way to end it. <laughs> that story. Talking about data. <laughs> I can, thank you. I'm going to show you. Can you see that? Hey, I, I can see part of it. That came out while I'm 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 colorblind, so I can only see uh, one very out. thin, thin, bright line. While you were reading, nice. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Rain, rainless bow. Exactly. Thank you, mm -hmm. everyone. It was very special.
Look yeah. forward to next time. Thank you again, Tyson. Sweet. Bye. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you.